My name is Ben Turner. I'm discussing my paper, Permissionless Consensus in the Resource Model, in which I propose an abstraction called a resource that generalizes many proofs of x, and I show minimal conditions to imply consensus given this abstraction. In the classical consensus problem, we're given n parties, all with one-bit inputs, and our goal is to design a protocol that satisfies the following three properties. The first is agreement, which means that all parties output the same bit. The second is termination, which means that the protocol must terminate within a finite number of steps. And the third is non-triviality, or validity, which says that if all honest parties have the same input, then they must output that bit. So if they all have input 0, they output 0, and if they all have input 1, then they must output 1. So given a few parties, each with 1-bit inputs, the parties will send messages to each other. And somehow, by communicating, they will change their outputs to the same thing and then terminate. Classical consensus protocols specifically use thresholds on the number of parties in order to achieve consensus. In the permissionless model, parties can come and go as they choose, and we don't know who will participate before an execution begins. So we use new modeling, new primitives, and new techniques to achieve consensus. We start by saying that every party will have an identity from some ID space, and you can consider this to be either the set of all IP addresses, or all of the possible public keys in some public key signature scheme. Then, over the course of an execution, the set of participants will come online. Each participant will assume some unique identity, and you can consider the set of participants to be every party that sends or, receive or receives a message during the execution. So, assume some large set of participants comes online. The protocol doesn't know which parties have come online during this specific execution. So the way that most permissionless protocols work is they hold a lottery among the parties that have come online in order to determine who should send messages. And specifically, the protocol allows that only parties that have self-selected as being online by winning the lottery get to send messages. We let the parties that have a star be the ones that have won the lottery, and now we can down-select and let these parties send messages and treat all the other parties as bystanders. And it turns out that this down-selection technique has proven useful for reducing the total number of bits that have to be communicated even for classical protocols. And we observe that it's very important to tune the rate of the number of parties that win the lottery for any specific amount of time. If we don't, and it's easy to win the lottery, then possibly every party that's alive at some amount, point in time might win the lottery. And now we haven't down-selected at all. But even worse, if it's cheap to win the lottery, then an adversary can launch Sybil attacks by creating a bunch of false identities and having those identities also win the lottery. And now the number of bad parties that have won the lottery and are speaking can far outnumber the number of honest parties. So, one of Satoshi Nakamoto's great innovations was to tie the ability to win the lottery to some physical resources, in the hopes that if the honest guys maintain more physical resources than the corrupt guys over time, then the honest guys are always going to control a majority of the resources and win a majority of the lotteries, and therefore we can hopefully bootstrap consensus based on this idea. Many lottery implementations have been proposed, starting with proof of work, followed by proof of stake, and including lots of different proof of x. We're going to discuss a couple of them, and then generalize what a lottery is accomplishing. In the original proof of work, parties would take their local protocol state and sample random nonce, and input them to the proof of work function. And every unique evaluation of the proof-of-work function would constitute one lottery ticket. A winning lottery ticket would be found if the evaluation of the proof-of-work function on the nonce and the local protocol state would be less than 2 to the d for some difficulty parameter. And the name of the game here is to try as many nonces as you can so that you can evaluate as many lottery tickets as you can and thereby have the best chance of winning. 
Proof of work encouraged a lot of wasteful energy use as people bought more hardware in order to evaluate more lottery tickets and used up a lot of energy. So proof of stake was introduced in order to tie the number of lottery tickets to something other than the amount of electricity that you could consume. So we said, well, we're going to give everybody uh, some number of lottery tickets that's proportional to the amount of stake that they have in the system. So the proof of stake function takes a local protocol state and a time slot and a piece of stake. And similarly, you evaluate those three with your proof of stake, func stake function and you have a winning ticket if your output is less than 2 to the d. Now, the number of uh, lottery tickets that you get is the number of stakes that you have per time slot times the number of uh, valid local protocol states that you can have per that time slot. In this work, we're going to look for an abstraction for this lottery process that captures what happens with a lot of different kinds of proof of x. And we're going to look for some minimal properties of the abstraction and some minimal assumptions on a network that will imply consensus. A number of other attempts have been made to find the minimal properties of puzzles that imply consensus. Gray et al. gave signatures of work, which include the property that finding one puzzle solution doesn't help with finding another, and they showed that their formalization implies consensus. Miller et al. wanted to discourage mining pools for Bitcoin, and they presented non-outsourceable scratch-off puzzles that they show also uh, imply consensus. Allen and Tochman formalized proofs of effort based on moderately hard functions, and they prove or they provide a framework for reasoning about um, computational resources, which allow binding strings to the proofs of effort. Lewis Pye and Roughgarden also proved a cap style theorem that in order to have liveness for permissionless protocol in a partially synchronous network, you must also know the participation. This was similar to a theorem by Poss and Shi that said if the network delay is unknown, the participation must be known within a factor of two. Our approach is we're going to define kind of an API for any resource producing process or any resource producing protocol such that as long as the resource producing process fits a few simple properties in the aggregate over the course of an execution, we'll show how to get permissionless consensus. And really what we're doing is we're focusing on an abstraction of the lottery ticket. So as long as you have a system that produces winning lottery tickets that over the course of an execution fulfills a couple of, of properties, um, then we're going to show that you have consensus and we're not going to make any requirements um, on the specific algorithms that uh, produce these things. So in our model, we'll have a number of parties who are participating in some execution, maybe sending messages to each other. And every so often, a party is going to come up with a winning lottery ticket. For us, this lottery ticket is what we call a resource. And when a party gets a resource, it's like Popeye. He eats his spinach and he becomes very strong. So the party that gets a resource is going to have a special power in the protocol to send a special message. For our resources, we're going to say there are only two properties. The first one is unforgeability, which enforces that you can only get a resource from whatever your resource producing protocol is. The second one is binding, which means that whoever gets a resource has to immediately choose a string that is going to be associated with that resource. So by analogy, for unforgeability, you can't just make up a winning lottery ticket. And in practice, this is going to be enforced by being verifiable. So if somebody says claims that they have a resource, claims they have a POX, you can send it to them. And uh, the receiver can just evaluate a hash function to verify that they've received a winning lottery ticket. For binding, this is going to be your input to your POX function. So for proof of stake and also sometimes for proof of work, the string that's going to be bound is your public key. And you send a, you can later send uh, special messages in the protocol that are signed and verify with that public key. And this is how you uh, can bootstrap some number of, of important messages based on uh, receiving a single resource. In the next couple of slides, we're going to explain how we formalize the way that resources enter an execution. First thing we do is we discretize time. So an execution proceeds in a series of steps. And on this slide, they start with t0, and they're going to advance past t12. And we're going to let rho 
be an upper bound on the rate at which resources can enter the system. And that rate is going to be in terms of the network delay delta. So we say that no more than row resources can enter the system per any delta time. And on this slide, you can see row is 3 and delta is 3. And in no series of uh, three steps do more than three resources enter the execution. We're also going to quantify the ratio of the number of resources that are obtained by honest parties versus the number of resources that are obtained by corrupt parties. We use the notation that psi from t to t prime is the set of resources that enter an execution between t and t prime. And we can say that uh, an allocation of resources is alpha epsilon honest if the total number of resources that are given to honest parties between t and t prime is greater than alpha times the total number of resources that are uh, allocated between t and t prime minus some epsilon. So here, alpha is a long-term lower bound on the proportion of resources that honest parties receive, and epsilon is a little skew parameter. So similarly, uh, an execution is beta epsilon corrupt if the total number of corrupt resources is upper bounded by a beta proportion of all of the resources over time, where epsilon works in the opposite way for the corrupt allocation. So you can think about epsilon as this little parameter that allows the corrupt parties to make a burst. So they invest all of their energy into getting a couple extra resources in the short term, but they have to pay for it in the long term. And the way that they pay for it is that after, after this burst, um, they're not going to be able to get any more resources until the honest parties do. So now that we have defined the properties of resources and we've given some constraints on an execution that talk about how resources enter the system, we're going to ask how powerful are resources? Specifically, under what conditions do resources imply consensus? And our main result is that permissionless consensus is achievable at any rate, so that's rho, as long as the honest parties receive a long-term majority of resources. Now this uh, theorem does require that when the rate is high, the um, majority of resources is going to increase along with, along with the rate, and actually has, uh, along with the square of the rate. But given any upper bound on the rate, there is a long-term honest majority uh, that permits you to have permissionless consensus, and we're going to show how to uh, con construct a protocol that gives you consensus, even in the presence of a rather strong adversary. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to say what are the powers of our strong adversary in our model. The first thing that the adversary can do is it can control what we call activations and corruptions. So we're going to say that a party is active at some point in time if it's listening for messages at that point in time, and the adversary can also adaptively corrupt as many of the active parties as it wants. So in one step, the adversary can decide on a set of honest parties to be online and a bunch of corrupt parties to be online. And in the very next step, the adversary can introduce a bunch more corrupt parties. And it can remove as many parties as it wants. And between steps, the adversary can even completely switch the set of online honest parties. The second thing is that the adversary can control the network delay up to some constraint on the network delta, which is going to be unknown to the parties and unknown to the protocol. In a delta synchronous network, there's some delta that upper bounds the amount of time between when a message is sent and when that message must be received. So let's say there's a party P that the adversary decides is alive at time T. P may not have been alive for a long time before this, so P is required to receive all of the messages that were sent to it before times t minus delta, which it has not yet received. For the messages that are sent to p between t minus delta and t, it's up to the adversary to decide whether p receives those messages. In our setting, we consider the network to be partially synchronous. Partial synchrony was introduced by Dwork, Lynch, and Stockmeyer. And in a partially synchronous network, the parties don't know what delta is, but it does exist.
And in our model, we're actually going to say that the parties don't know delta, but they do know rho. And in the paper, we argue that this is strictly weaker than knowing delta. Finally, the adversary gets to decide who gets a resource and when, and we say that uh, the adversary allocates a resource to a party in order to give it a resource at some moment in time. So at any time step, the adversary may decide that no parties receive a resource, and at the next time step, the adversary can pick a couple of parties to receive resources, maybe even more corrupt parties than honest parties. And then it's allowed to change the set of parties that are online, including by taking away the, all the honest parties that got resources. And so on and so forth. As the execution proceeds, the adversary decides who gets resources and how many to allocate. Now, one feature of our model is that we really don't count the proportion of honest parties that are online against the proportion of corrupt parties that are online. Of course, if you have more honest parties online, then you expect them to get more resources than the corrupt parties. But your protocol should still work if there are just two honest parties and they still somehow are very powerful and they get more resources than a large set of corrupt parties. So for, the, uh, for our model, the previous two situations are really equivalent executions. We really don't count the, the honest parties that are online, and the only thing that we have to count is the number of resources that the honest parties and the corrupt parties receive. The main protocol in the paper is for so-called graph consensus. We introduce graph consensus as a generalization of what most people know as blockchains. In a graph consensus protocol, every party has its own local view of some graph that is defined to start with some root vertex. And the parties communicate in order to propose new vertices that should be added to, the, to everybody's graphs. So eventually, all parties are going to build these ideas of graphs in, um, in their local view. And in our case, uh, all of the graphs are going to be DAGs. In addition to having some local graph in a party's view, every party is also going to output a graph at every moment in time. That graph we're going to refer to as G star, and G star is going to be a subgraph of that party's view of uh, its full graph. And a graph consensus protocol is going to require two properties. The first we call graph consistency, and the second we call FH liveness. Graph consistency just says that for any two parties, I and J, and for any two moments of time, one party's uh, output graph is going to be a subgraph of the other party's output graph. F liveness is going to say that the total number of vertices in any party's output graph is going to be lower bounded by some function f of the total number of resources that have been introduced into the execution so far. H liveness is going to say that the number of vertices that were proposed by honest parties is going to be lower bounded by some function h of the total number of vertices in that party's graph. You can think of h as an analog uh, analogous to chain quality from the blockchain literature. In the next slides, we present our graph consensus protocol. First, we define the depth of a vertex, which we do in a non-standard way. The depth of the root vertex, which is always the flower vertex in these slides, is zero. The depth of every other vertex is the length of the longest path from that vertex to the root. We also define the depth of a graph to be the depth of the deepest vertex in the graph. In our graph consensus protocol, all parties start with a graph that consists only of the root vertex. And occasionally, some party will receive a resource. When it does, it adds that resource as a vertex in, our, in its graph. So in our graph consensus protocol, all of the vertices are resources except for the root vertex. It adds the resource as a vertex by adding the resource on the end of the graph that it currently has in its view. And it adds an edge from the new vertex to every vertex in its graph that is number one within some constant c of the depth of the total graph, and number two to vertices that do not yet have any inbound edges. We're going to discuss later that c is computed in order to guarantee that every honest vertex eventually gains an honest successor in the graph. But after adding the new vertex to the graph, the party that got the resource is just going to multicast its new graph to all the other parties in the execution. Next, we describe what a party does when it 
receives a message that contains a new graph with vertices that it hasn't yet seen. And the rule is simply that the party computes graph union with the new graph that it hears. So if I was the party who held the blue graph in the previous slide, then there were three new vertices that I just add to my graph. Finally, we have to explain how a party computes its output graph, G star, from its current view. We start by defining the set of what we call the starting vertices, which are all of the vertices in the party's local view that are within C plus row depth of the depth of the total graph. Then we define a constant L star that's going to be similar to a stabilization parameter. And the party will output all of the vertices that are, number one, reachable from a starting vertex, and number two, farther than L star depth from the end of the graph. So you can see here that there's one vertex of depth three that is not reachable from a starting vertex, even though it is more than L star de uh, depth away from the, the total depth of the graph. We're going to prove that if there's any vertex in a party's graph that's more than L star depth away from the end of the graph and not reachable from a starting vertex, then that vertex must have been pro proposed by a corrupt party. And we're also going to prove a lemma that all honest vertices are eventually output by every party. So every honest vertex is eventually going to um, become more than L star depth away from the end of the graph, and it's going to be reachable from, uh, from some starting vertex. And so as a uh, party's graph grows, which depends only on the fact that more resources are allocated in the execution, eventually uh, every honestly proposed vertex is going to be, um, is going to be buried more than L star deep and is going to be output by whatever party has it in its view. Now we're going to explain some of the main lemmas in the proof. First, we're going to conduct the analysis by defining a big graph in the sky that we call big G. And big G is the union of all of the vertices in every party's view. <clears throat> so when an honest party adds a vertex to its local graph, that vertex immediately becomes a part of big G. And also when a corrupt party um, introduces a new vertex in its graph, that vertex becomes a uh, part of big G, even if the corrupt party did not tell anybody about the vertex, so even if it with withholds the vertex in, uh, in analogous to a selfish mining attack. So if you remember the rule that said uh, an honest party adds an uh, edge to every vertex that's within C of the depth of the total graph, but no does not yet have an inbound edge, we prove a lemma that this is in fact the um, the depth necessary to guarantee that every honest vertex eventually gains an honest successor. And the way we do that is we show that any honest vertex that's not within L1, for some uh, specific L1 that we compute, and not within L1 at the end of, the, of an honest graph, then that um, vertex must have an honest successor already in big G. And this lets us show that eventually on, all honest vertices are eventually accepted because every honest vertex is multicast to the whole group. And therefore, if, if every honest vertex eventually gains an honest successor, then um, eventually every honest vertex will be buried deep enough in the graph to output. And it turns out that the worst thing that the adversary can do is construct a withheld branch of the graph that it doesn't tell any of the honest parties about. And we define a constant L2 that tells us exactly how long, in terms of depth, that the adversary's withheld chain can keep pace with the growth of big G. The adversary doesn't even need to have one vertex at every level of depth because it can have its vertices point to honest parties' vertices. So in effect, the adversary's power to grow a withheld chain is C times the number of vertices that it gets. So we require that the honest parties, even when they're adding their own vertices concurrently, drive the depth of the graph in the long term to be more than C times the number of vertices that the adversary gets. And we define L star to be L1 plus L2, where L star is the stabilization parameter. In essence, we know that if a vertex is buried L star deep in any party's graph, then there cannot be a completely withheld corrupt chain that um, A points to that vertex via a path of edges that spans no more than, uh, for which each edge spans no more than C depth, and for which this path uh, includes a starting vertex in any party's view. Okay, finally, we use our graph consensus protocol to show that one bit consensus is possible in our resource model. So the theorem is that if you have a long-term majority of resources and you have a graph consensus protocol, then you can get one bit consensus. And what you do is you just run a graph consensus protocol until you're guaranteed that 
every party has a majority of honest vertices in its graph. And uh, on the way to proving this lemma, you have to show that, um, in fact, you can pick some depth, and then every um, every party can run up to some depth, run a graph consensus protocol, and include all the vertices up to that depth. And then, if they're guaranteed that a majority of resources were um, provided to the honest parties, then a majority of those vertices are going to be proposed by honest honest players. And you have to modify the graph consensus protocol so that um, every time a party gets a resource, it can append a bit. So it binds another bit to that resource that includes its vote. So uh, parties always uh, vote for whatever their input was. So if I get three resources, I get three votes, and I never change my, my vote. So I always embed my input into um, my, my vertex. And that gives you one big consensus protocol. And those are the highlights of the paper. Please uh, check it out, the full version on ePrint, and thanks for listening.